So welcome to Shoot Me Straight. Uh, we're here uh, with Eric. Aaron. Aaron Stude. Sorry. Oh, yep. good. Uh, last name again? Czar. Czar. Aaron Czar. Uh, and today we're not joined by David. Uh, he's he's off on a trip, which is uh, a good thing because now you're just going to have to hear my voice. So. Perfect. <laughs> but uh, Aaron, you are the founder of Silent? Yes. Correct? Yeah. Um, yeah, co-founder. Co-founder. Yep. Okay. Um, and yeah, yeah, well, thank you for coming down here uh, to Florida to visit. I know you were down here on some business, but I appreciate you taking the time to come over here and jump on the podcast uh, and sort of talk about Silent, um, where it started and where you see it going. Um, but uh, let's uh, start off with who you are. Um, where, uh, where'd where you grow up? Uh, Santa Cruz, California. Nice. All right. Yeah, good my, spot. Uh, yeah, my oldest son was a uh, banana slug for a little bit. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, he uh, went there right after high school, um, and I think he did about – Three classes short of getting his chemistry degree and then decided it wasn't for him, and now he's in Marine Corps boot camp. <laughs> so All right, drastic then. change, yeah. but, uh, yeah, he uh, he was up there for three years. I visited him a couple times. It's it's a cool spot. Oh, yeah, I mean, if you like to get educated in the trees in the yeah. redwood forest, it's pretty good. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah, it's, in, it's pretty insane. Yeah, got a good surf out there as well. Yeah, I grew up in Santa Cruz, which is, a you know, a, I'm almost 40 now, so – Back when I was going to high school, it was, you know, like, separated. There wasn't social media. It was, like, it was amazing. It was yeah. Like quite isolated in the best way with, like, tons of nature and waves and surfing and mountains and trees. So were you uh, big into surfing or? Yeah, I grew up surfing. Like, got into it more in my teens and, yeah, became a big part of my life. But nice. always, like, I mean, I grew up in the ocean. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you're going to stay by the ocean? That's your... Uh, I live in Vegas now. Okay, so. Haven't seen the ocean lately. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I travel quite a bit as well for work and pleasure. So um, nice. I find myself surfing and enjoying the beach in chunks. Have and you then, uh, checked out the beach here since you've been here? Swells on. Yeah. I mean, it's like looks like could, I didn't think there would be, but, yeah. Yeah, we're staying um, down by the beach, which is nice. Nice, yeah. It's hit or miss here. I mean, there's really not – that big of waves most of the time here but every once in a while we'll, we'll get some and yeah you came at a perfect time yeah no equipment but my good friend lives here too in Destin so we're gonna get out in the water in the morning nice yeah I think these are probably some of the most beautiful beaches that uh you can be at yeah, for just sure. need the sun to come out hopefully tomorrow yeah yeah today was trying to get burnt a little bit be careful what you wish for, because <laughs> that once that sun comes out, you for sure will. Yeah, um, I'm just joking. No, it's but deadly. This is a perfect time of time of year to come down here. Um, I think people think of Florida. You know, they're like, oh, it's hot all the time and humid and muggy, which is true for I think a majority of the year. But uh, here up in the Panhandle, usually around uh, October all the way to February. I mean, it gets uh, it gets down to the 30s. Um, and it's we have mm. like sort of a season here, so it's it's like perfect fall weather uh, for the next four months, which I'll take because after that it's just scorching hot the rest of the time. Yeah, take it. Well, it's nice to have seasons, you know. I think it rallies people to enjoy it more and get out. And yeah, know, I think you need a little bit of pain where you live. I think so too. I think you need a little bit of pain in everything you do. Sure. Yeah, I'll back that. Yeah. So uh, Santa Cruz, you grew up there. Um, yep. Did you, uh, where'd you go to college at or did you? Um, I went, yeah, I went to San Diego state. Okay. And it was in state, which I didn't want to go out of state, but it was as far away from Santa Cruz as I could get. Water's warm. Mexico's right there. And it just provided like a really fun lifestyle uh -huh. plus, um, getting to study business and like lean into that and had two of my best friends join kind of all ended up there. So okay. It was good. That's funny. The water was warm. So I didn't even know it. I mean, I did, <laughs> but I grew up in Santa Cruz. It was like properly cold. Yeah. And then we went there and it's 73 degrees and everyone's half naked on the beach. And my eyes were peeled back. I was like, this is where I want to go to school. That's hilarious. Yeah. I have a sort of different depiction of the water there in San Diego just from the uh, <laughs> time I spent in it. Fair uh, enough. For sure. It's a, uh, I would say Florida water. Uh, water is warm but yeah uh, compared to santa cruz for sure yeah yeah absolutely i'm sure your time <laughs> in the water was just like overextended it, it is not that cold though i mean it, it's cold enough 
Um, but it's doable for sure. Did you do your training there? Yeah, yeah. So that's where um, SEAL training is mm-hmm. there in Coronado. Uh, yeah. And then obviously – I was stationed there afterwards for most of my time. And so we do, yeah, all of our training in the water and, you know, the water, like I find the temperature, it's not like freezing, but it's cold enough. And then they make it, they can make it freezing, you know, if they want to. So what was that like? Uh, I mean, that's a big question, but I guess just in, in relation to the water, the, the training, mm-hmm. um, I mean, it's, it's the one element I think that, uh, gets, a lot of people to quit. Um, it's, you know, it's mother nature and, uh, mm-hmm. you're not going to defeat that. And it's, uh, they, they know how to use it well. Um, but like you said, or you said before, you know, you need a little bit of pain to, uh, get stronger and to overcome. And they definitely get that out of you if you make it all the way through. So, um, yeah, it's cool. I always say it's the best time I never want to have again. So, <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Yeah. So uh, SDSU, um, mm-hmm. and uh, where, where'd you go from there? Yeah, I, I pulled the ripcord right after I graduated because I didn't feel like San Diego was like a place where I could thrive. Mm-hmm. Um, got a great education, had a really good time, made great connections, and then I just needed to regroup and went back to Santa Cruz. Okay. Um, yeah, and started working for with my father. Um, commercial electrician. I just jumped right into the trades, which is not like the natural path after getting a bachelor's degree but it paid really well um got to work with my father and it led me to kind of like expand my horizon to get some cash and then move on to the next chapter nice how so you had, you had a pretty good relationship with your father then growing up and then yeah 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 Sounds i mean like my it. parents are still together i they still live in the same house i grew up in which is awesome like i feel like <laughs> not always the norm um, yeah that is uh outside the norm it seems like nowadays yeah, but my, yeah, my parents are a huge part of my life and, you know, my, I'll get into it, but I say co-founder because my father originally conceptualized this silent pocket pouch that you drop a device in and you disappear from the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how it started. Okay. So, uh, obviously, so you're working with your dad, um, and mm-hmm. things are going well, right? You're making good money. Yeah. Things are good. It just kind of like, I took a digger on a dirt bike and mm-hmm. blew out my neck and didn't do anything too crazy, but herniated disc and looking up is pretty much what you do as a commercial electrician. <laughs> yeah. And it just, I just saw my life not getting any better. And, um, yeah, moved to, moved to San Francisco and got into selling high end wine. Really? So I was the wine guy for like five years. What is, uh, no bad times doing that. What's the, what's the name for a wine like connoisseur? Um, a uh, sommelier. sommelier, yeah, it was at yeah. the tip of my tongue. More like uh, in the streets, sommelier, <laughs> learn learn by drinking it and yeah. just talk on the phone a lot. Of, but, it, I mean, if you just cut it down, it was a direct-to-consumer sales job over the phone. So I just cold-called my way to success. Is there, uh, like, a certain wine company that you worked for? That um, a bunch of different labels that we sold, but yeah, the company that I worked for is no longer in existence, but one of the wines was Duranacourt, California, which is okay. like a French wine project. So it was high end and yeah, I mean, I grew up with the jerky boys and this, yes. was, this was like, <laughs> this was like Wolf of Wall Street meets jerky boys and we would just go nuts on the phone and that's where I really like cut my teeth into learning about sales and asking for the order and being persistent and resilient so it was a kick-ass time. That's awesome. Yeah. So it gave you the experience you needed to get where you sort of in in a, in a way to get where you are now. Uh, yeah, it got me a great amount of money, mm-hmm. and it got me pretty jaded on the company I was working for and what I was doing, and I just kind of bent my morals a bit, and then that's what led me into silent. Yeah. What uh? In what ways did you? Like, have to bend your morals a little bit to... Just shoving wine down people's throats that they didn't yeah. really need. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could sleep at night just fine. I mean, at the end of the day, it's like a pretty, like... And it's... I could never be a stockbroker. Yeah. Or someone that, you know, like, took someone's livelihood and had it crumble. Um, we were selling wine, but yeah. it was expensive. Um, yeah, it just didn't feel right anymore. Didn't fulfill me. Yeah, I can see that. I mean... 
I think it, I look at it at the end of the day, it's like they're making the decision to buy the wine. Um, but yeah, you're sort of coaxing them into. Yeah, it's just like, you know, like sales is, I guess, in a way, manipulation in a bit. Yeah. You're getting what you want, but it just kind of like you're twisting the screwdriver a little too hard into certain people. And it just felt like I was getting on the path of taking advantage. And mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm a tote myself as a good person. I just wanted to have more value with what I was peddling. Yeah. Well, I mean, good on you for for feeling that way and sort of sticking to your guns and yeah. leaving. I think a large majority of the people uh, end up taking the money over their over their morals. Yeah. I think in hindsight, I probably would have stayed a little bit longer just to squeeze out some money and help float my transition to uh, starting silent. But yeah, okay. hindsight's twenty twenty. Yeah. I had to jump off at some point. So you, uh, when you decided to jump off, did you already have? Um, the sort of the idea of silent in mind is that where you went to next yeah that's where i went to next actually i left there and went back to santa cruz and um my dad so my dad created this pouch in the late 90s and when i was in san francisco it was 2009 to 2013 or so so he created this pouch in the 90s i'm in middle school and he's like hey check this thing out drops his little flip phone in there and tries to call it doesn't ring i'm like I had no conception of why that is even needed or what you would need something like yeah. that for. Like the onset of mobile technology was just trying to come up. Uh, but he foresaw a big problem and he was deemed crazy, paranoid. Like, why would you ever need this? So he curbed it. And then in around 2009, when I was living in San Francisco, he, um, he decided to like create a brand and like do some cut and sew and make these pouches called silent pocket, just mm-hmm. silent pocket at the time. And, yeah, so he, like, launched it, had a little splash website, and he could take phone orders, and he had this big buzz going because it was, like, the emergence of mobile tech, and yeah, people were concerned about that, and, like, an electronic leash, and he called it, like, cutting electronic leash, which is still applicable today. Oh, for sure. Um, I mean, I think that's pretty amazing <clears throat> that he had the foresight back in the day to be like, yeah, this is going to be an issue. Oh, yeah, because he was just, like, middle finger to the man. He's like, I don't want, like, I, I, part hippie, part Republican. I want to be able to have my autonomy and live my life and, you know, look where we're at now. Yeah. Like, it's, you can't. It's almost impossible. It's impossible, nearly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so, in, like, 2012, he had always wanted, you know, like I said I was an electrician with him. He always wanted to have Czar and Sons company got burnt out on the trades. So he kind of like created this thing and was like, Hey, you want to take it from here? And I was at the time, like, was wow, a cool opportunity to like rely on my marketing that I studied. Like I'm kind of creator at heart and intuitive. So I just kind of put the pieces together. So I took it on as this like pet project, see where it would go. And I had an, another income still. Mm-hmm. I was kind of like spotlighting here and there at the company that I, I quit from. But then they're like, hey, do you want to come back once a month and sell the people that never get called? <laughs> so it was just lay down sales. I'd make commissions. So I had something to float me. And I took it on and had some early success where he had left off and rebranded it, launched it, fleshed out the product line, and had a, a really nice sale. It was like 25 k at the time that seed funded the whole company. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah. And, I mean, where we stand now over a decade later is a whole different place. Yeah. I mean, so you guys have been pushing it for the past decade, right? Yeah. Pretty hard. Um, so with the first the first uh, item that you came out with was then the, the sleeve. Mm-hmm. It, it was called the suit pocket because the original premise was like, well, who, who carries a phone? Business people. Yeah. Um, and then the suit pocket, like the actual dimensions, like here's one. This is based off they would – slide into the suit pocket and you could flip it open, pop your phone inside, um, which is now like our, one of our patented products and it's a sleeve and it magnetically closes. It's really sleek. Um, but that was the, that was the bread and butter and kind of still is. It drives a lot of sales. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that is, I mean, I have that, um, and I use it every time I travel. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it, I get asked, you know, all the time, like, Oh, well, why do you, you know, why do you need that? Or, Biggest question we get, too. Yeah. Um, you know, and I give them my explanation. I'm like, hey, man, you know, if I can protect my security, my privacy, um, 
and all that, any chance I can, I will. Uh, mm-hmm. Because especially when you, for me, because I'm always traveling, always in the airports. Yeah. Um, and I think that's when, I believe that's when you're at most risk, right? Because that's where you have all these people, you know, gathered up in one airport that are traveling everywhere. And I think that's where the biggest risk is of getting your stuff stolen. Uh, because there are people out there that are doing it. And it's easier than you think to do it. Oh, yeah. I mean, we exhibit at hacking conventions and, you know, like DEF CON's a big one that we did earlier this year, and it's awesome. And if you want to go see how vulnerable our, our phones are and just go check out some of the seminars and, and active hacking that's happening there. It's pretty eye-opening. And on your end, coming from um, your background, like I'm sure you know all too well about how easy it is to track and locate and hack and oh, yeah. exploit digital devices. So. Well, that's the other thing is, you know, when I did start using it, um, there is like a, a weird feeling of like, okay, I'm, I'm untrackable right now. Um, mm-hmm. Because I think what people don't realize is you're tracked all the time. And mm-hmm. yeah, they may not be specifically t- tracking you or targeting you. You are still being tracked. And people might think, you know, oh, what's the big deal? Um, I'm not doing anything wrong. I don't, I don't care if they track me well. Yeah, that's all fine and dandy until they want to find something to track you about or they want to target you. And then they already have everything and they can make and manipulate things the way they want to, to, you know, brand you however they would like. You took the words out of my mouth 100%. Gather enough data, it could be used against you. Yeah. In any any form. So, yeah, I mean, we have a strong customer base and we're growing and I think there's a, an awareness and adoption around what mobile privacy and security as well as health mean. And those are the three pillars that we operate on. But um, yeah, I think the average person should be like, have their eyes a little bit more open about the conveniences that we have and the downside of like the erosion of privacy. Yeah. And I do like the uh, health aspect of it as well. Mm -hmm. Um, That's one of your pillars. I mean, because that's also a fact. I mean, when I put my phone away, um, especially when I'm at the airport or wherever, I, th- I throw it in there and, you know, throw it in my bag. And I really don't want to, like, I'm like, and there's times when I have it in there, I'm like, oh, maybe I should check on this or do whatever. But then I'm like, you know what? No, just leave it in there. I'll get it later. And it takes away that, like, natural anxiety that you have when you have your device in your hand. Because mm-hmm. uh, I, I believe that everyone has it, you know. Oh, it's all of a sudden it's in your hand and open and you're on... Yeah. On your social feed, you're like, how did that happen? Exactly. And the next thing you know, you're scrolling. And the next thing you know, 10 minutes goes by and you literally accomplish nothing. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, that phone is listening to you. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, um, yeah. I think that's one thing. And I think it's crazy. People have become accustomed to it, to where it's like not a big deal. But I. It's justified. You know, yeah. People justify it. You know, it's hard to break habits. Yeah. Big time. I, to me, it's scary. Because, and I said that, you know, when we first started finding out about it, you know, maybe a couple years ago where you would say certain things, you know, you have a conversation with your wife or one of your buddies about, it doesn't matter if it's a product or whatever. And the next thing you know, you're being advertised that product on your phone. Oh, um, the machines know more about you than you know about yourself. Yeah. And that's like one data point. So through that collection, it's just like, boom, here's the vacuum you wanted. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm like, well, how how long is it going to take before this thing, you know, because it does know you better than you know yourself and starts manipulating you um, Mm -hmm. to do certain things, right? And, I mean, maybe that's my crazy conspiracy mind going awry, but I don't don't think so, you know. I don't think so at all. And all these devices and all the software on top of it are are not made with privacy at the forefront. Yeah. You know, like there are, like, great applications and tools now that are privacy by design, but – cool thing about silent is just like a one-way street we're really like in point security where you put your phone inside and it's like mute from the world but on the health aspect we're we're leaning into that quite a bit as well and we want to educate and help people with for their mental health um for the physical protection like we're not designed to be next to devices that output high frequencies Mm -hmm. which could do cell manipulation and really cause like harm over a longer period of time and there's new studies coming out now that really show, like, hold a cell phone to your head for the next 10 years and you're going to have a tumor in your head. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen that study as well. And, like, you know, I think for a lot of people, 
uh, sleep at night, you know, and they charge their phone right next to their head because they're like, oh, I want to hear it if it goes off or whatever. Um, and I think they've done, like you said, done studies that's a detriment to your health for having that. I, I don't know exactly the details of what it does to you. I mean, do you, do you know? Well, some of the, the, the ratings that it's based off of, like the SAR ratings, which are specific absorption rate, is what you're like, you go in the legal clause of your iPhone, your Android, and you, you go to the legal section, RF exposure. It's going to say what the limits are. And it says, oh, I'll keep this away from your body at all times, five millimeters. Those <laughs> parameters <laughs> are over 50 years old. Yeah. So they need to be updated. We're bombarded with RF signal. But there's no corporation or company that's going to come out and wave the flag and be like, oh, yeah, we might uh, cause cancer. That's in the... That's in the fine print where it's like, hey, do you consent? And you're, you just scroll to the bottom like, yeah, I'm not going to read through all this. I read a lot of that stuff, and it's terribly boring yeah. for, for a reason. Yeah. But yeah. We're giving away the farm in terms of our privacy and data, and, yeah, the health is a big one. Yeah, for sure. And then also, I mean, isn't it keeping it in your, like, front pockets too? Um, yeah. Does, does it – because I, I don't know if it's a rumor or – whatever, but it does affect you like your sperm count or like, well, Andrew Huberman came out and you know, he's a good person as, yeah. a, as a barometer. Um, any yeah, others direct correlation of like lowered sperm count and testosterone related to radiation exposure from your phone, which is like high frequency, which is your cell Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and then lower frequencies and thermal heat as well. So it's a combination of things. <laughs> so but, awesome. But the problem is <laughs> you, you might, you say those things now and it's getting better, but there's a lot of companies riding a wave of misinformation, peer studied reviews and BS like design patents, like pendants on around your neck that neutralize your EMF field or these stickers that you chuck on your phone. It's all BS. Yeah. And then there's, there's some clothing companies that make like shielded clothing, but it's really like um, lab tests mixed with human results and they just like pluck out these metrics that are, are supposed to make sense. And they they, they tweak some, the findings. Put to some cool marketing on it. And like people just want to take the pill and feel better. It's like, oh my God, there's this magic thing that instantly makes this phone harmless. They want to believe yeah. so bad. Well, because the last thing they want to do is put their phone away or not have it by them. They're like, no, we, I don't want to do that. Yeah. I'll just wear this pendant and that'll I'm make good. me feel better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's. It's, I think it's uh feels illegal. To uh, me. Immoral. Immoral for sure. Yeah. Um which Maybe, is, yeah, not in this country. It wouldn't be illegal in this country. But no. it all their studies is like it's based off it doesn't block anything, do anything. It's just based off of a physiological response. Yeah. I mean they're they're taking advantage of people. Yeah. Um which is what you you talked about with the wine thing, right? You're like, I don't yeah. feel right doing this. I'm yeah taking advantage and but this is the land of opportunity. Um, Fair I'm, enough. And there, I mean, and, you know that that swings both ways, right? I think it's a, it's a it's a good thing that this is a land of opportunity, and people can, you know, make them make something of themselves here. This is that's what America has been known for. But on the other hand, there are people that will uh, take tragic things into an opportunity um, mm -hmm. and make money. I mean, that's from. You know, all the way from politicians down to, you know, your regular civilian. So, yeah, and people have been selling snake oil for yeah. thousands of years. So everybody's got a gimmick. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, silent products. You know, they they actually do something. You know, you you don't get to use your phone or you don't you get to use your device. But there's a time and place for that. So yeah, they, and they're actually like fully shutting it down, which is nice. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and you guys, I mean, you guys have obviously um, gone leaps and bounds from the sleeve. Um, yeah. So now, I mean, you've, I, I, I have a, one of your backpacks, mm -hmm. um, which I wear all the time. I love it. Great, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, what is it, the the dry bag? It's a 20 liter uh, roll down yeah. dry bag, yeah. So yeah. It's a big cavity. You could chuck everything inside. That's what I like down, about it. Dude, it. It fits so much stuff in there, and yeah. but you can compact it down. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's light. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure you get you travel a lot. You get instant peace of mind. You just put all your devices inside there, and you're just like present and yep. feel, more, feel more comfortable. Oh, for sure. Um, and that's what I tell people when they ask me about it. I'm like, dude, it's 
it's legit. I throw everything in there. Not only do I feel secure that all my stuff's being protected, but my mental health, like I'm, like you said, present, Mm -hmm. right. Of what's actually going on around me. Um, Yeah. Which is, uh, it's huge. You know, there's a lot of distractions these days. That is for sure. And we're, we're placated with trying to respond instantly. And we have this like weird obligation that we have to like communicate and get back to everyone and, and know everything and absorb the entire world's news. And like, Nah, well, like we have to like we're not meant to take in that much information our brains no. aren't wired that way no. um and i think that's where a big part of the mental health epidemic is stemming from um you know the amount of uh depression anxiety especially with uh our young kids you know these kids mm-hmm. that have they're growing up with these devices and their their faces in it all day long yeah and you know i've gone through it to where my daughter, who where she's uh, she's nineteen, but you know she, I think we got her a phone when she was twelve or thirteen. Um, That's on the later side these days. Yeah, I mean my my youngest son just got one and he's fourteen, so we we held off. Um, but even when you hold off, like they you know you get them one of those phones and it's automatic, like they are no longer present and. The second you take that phone away, like, you know, they get in trouble, like, hey, the phone's gone for a week. You would think they were, you were taking a lung. I mean, <laughs> they're screaming, throwing, I mean, they're, they almost go into this like demonic state where you're like, dude, where, where are you? But it's, that's the, the power of that mm-hmm. phone. Um, and I think it has a lot of negative implications that as a society, we're just ignoring or we're trying to, like we talked about before, oh, it's not the phone, it's this. Or here's here's some pills to deal with your anxiety and depression, but don't put that phone away, you know. It's a massive problem. I mean, yeah. my daughter's only a year old, so I have those things to look forward to down yeah. the road. Who but, yeah, by the time she's she's of age, the way that uh, we're evolving, it'll be sketchy. something implanted or whatever. Like, I don't know. I can't even imagine um, where it's going to be in like 15 years. Yeah, I think I have, I'm i an optimistic person. I do have hope for the younger generation because I feel like they'll be more, I hope they'll be more um, able to deal with technology because they have a better understanding where it, it like entered my life way later. So yeah. I, like I'm kind of vulnerable to it, you know? I'm like, oh, that's shiny and new. Same. Right? Yeah. So, but we are doing a pilot program within schools with our Faraday bags. So kids are less distracted and present. Really? For the teacher's sake. So they could actually teach the yeah. figure and for the kids not to be distracted by the smartphone that does everything. So how, how is that going to work um, with what you're doing in the schools? Um, so essentially it'd be on, on their desk. So it's present. And the nice thing is that what's happening at schools there, the school is taking custody of people's phones. So I see that be, being a problem for like in the event of an active shooter, mm-hmm. there's no direct line for any of the students to be able to communicate to you back home, to law enforcement, um, where we want to change that and we want to have an ability to teach kids to deal with their phones and learn how to live with them um, and, like, to acknowledge that when they grow up, they're going to have to do the same. So it's it's yeah. not like, it's like, we don't trust you, we're going to take that from you, which I get, but if you trust them enough and put a, a tool then they could learn to have ownership over it and deal with it. That's awesome. And they get to keep, like, a tool to it could be life-saving. Yeah, because it is. I mean, and that's it, it is a necessary thing to have. I mean, that's, you know, we, you hold off long enough. You're like, you know, like our youngest son who just got his phone. He's a freshman in high school. And, I mean, for years, it's like he's the, out, you know, not outcast, but he's, like, only one without one. Mm-hmm. And... I did start feeling, you know, you start feeling bad for him because you're like, dude, this is how these kids communicate and like it or not, it's part of life now. Um, so yeah, I do that. That idea is that's sick because it's instead of like, Oh, just get rid of this. No, you it's needed, but here's a solution. Yeah. And yeah, we're excited about that. I think there's a lot of use cases that silent fits into. Um, but, uh, we are, uh, there's a company called smart social and, He's doing a great job at educating kids on, like, how to deal with social media, how to deal with phones in the school, because his whole goal is to prevent 
teen suicide. Yeah. I mean, online bullying and the issues that like I'm not even aware of um, at my age are so present and so real. They um, are. And, yep. and they should be taken seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I can say that I'm, I'm guilty of not taking it seriously when, you know, my, my daughter or even now my son is you know, going to school and yeah, they're, these kids are on that phone all day. And then it's what I found is like, you know, my daughter doesn't get invited to an event, but then there's all these people posting and, you know, we're at this event and then they feel yeah. you know, horrible that they're not there. And, and it's a lot of comparison. I mean, and I think adults do it as well. People compare themselves to others because there's so much information coming out on that thing. And it's hard to explain to a child or even like a high school or like, Hey man, it, it doesn't matter. Right. Like stop mm-hmm. comparing yourself because that's their world and that's what they're going through at that time. Um, and it, I think it is a, a huge problem. Um, and that, that needs to be taken. Like you, like we just talked about seriously, because there is a big, uh, uptick in suicides among teenagers. Yeah. I think if you could, you know, we were talking about breaking habits and like telling someone that they don't need their phone for a weekend. Cause we have this like detox program. Mm-hmm. Like we ask you to go 24 hours without your phone. Huge challenge. Yeah. You wouldn't think it is, but it, it really is for someone that has, a, you know, a career and a life and a family to communicate with. Um, but yeah, it's an uphill battle. But I think setting like routine, you know, if it happens at school and then you could set the same standard at your own home, you know, you could like have time where you, everyone puts their phone in a drawer or a silent product or something like that. And yeah, we, we ended up, there was some app that we had, so it was around eight thirty at night, all of our apps stopped working mm. like, and then they don't start working until a certain time the next day. That's great. Yeah. And that, that. you know, so then you don't take away the phone, but you're like, mm-hmm. you can't do anything on that except I mean, they can text, but yeah, yeah, there's can't endlessly scroll. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Get lost in the ether. Yeah. Well, it's very easy to do. I mean, all these, all this stuff is designed to hijack our attention. Yep. And we have to really combat that and like learn how to deal with it. For sure. I mean, I, I'm a perfect case study when, you know, um, uh, with everything that happened to me, uh, I got, I ended up getting thrown in military prison for nine and a half months and, for that whole time, didn't have a phone. Um, and I can honestly say, even though I was locked up in a cell facing life in prison, all this, all this amount of stress, like I could, I was, had more mental clarity at that time than I have had in a long time. It's because I had no other distractions. I didn't have a phone. I literally, it was just me. And I, you know, I read books, uh, and just really got to focus on my, myself and my mind and what was going on. But, you know, when I got released, I was out and I, you know, they were like, Oh, let's go get you a phone. And my immediate reaction was like, I don't want it. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't want a phone. A lot of stuff waiting there for you. Yeah. Right. And I was like, I honestly feel way better than I have in a long time. But the the reality is, is like, no, you need a phone. Um, It's Mm -hmm. just, it's on you to be responsible enough not to constantly be inundated on that thing with garbage uh yeah so. wild nine months yeah what was what was the strongest takeaway when you were in when you were in the strongest well the biggest takeaway you know i'm a i'm a, a man of faith and that was I'll, I'll never stop preaching that i'm like you know the only way i could i got through that was god uh you know i it was like two or three months in there i spoke out loud to him. I was like, dude, just take this from me. I like, I, of course, you know, like any man, I was trying to control everything, uh, trying to figure out ways to, you know, how can I get myself out of this? How can I fix this? And there was, I was not in control at all. And I just had to realize that and give everything to God. And once I did that and spoke out loud to him, um, I had this like very calm feeling come over me. Uh, not that it wasn't like easy street, but it definitely helped me the rest of the time I was in there. So mm. that will and always will be the biggest takeaway that I pass on to people uh, when they ask me, like, oh, how was that? How'd you deal with that? Mm-hmm. Um, but then, you know, the other ones were, you know, just like we talked about, like not having a phone, not not having all these distractions, uh, even though I was facing, you know, my, my life was 
you know, life in prison, um, it, there was a just sense of mental clarity. Um, and then you just find ways to sort of, uh, stay busy, um, without going crazy. So, I mean, I, like I said, I read a lot of books, uh, just, you know, wrote a lot. Um, it was, uh, you know, there were some good things that came out of it. So, um, and then also realizing that, you know, the government does not have your back, uh, when you think even though you've spent 20 years serving them in every way possible, it's, uh, it was, it was a big eye opener, but it was a good, a good eye opener. You know, um, it's your, your eyes are opened. And then from that point on, you know, I haven't shut them. It's like, I can see, I think over the past couple of years, this country has sort of seen a little bit of it and Mm -hmm. it really wasn't a surprise to us. Uh, you know, it was, I was got released from prison Went to trial, got found not guilty, finally got out of the military, and then, boom, the pandemic hit. And for us, it wasn't that big of a deal. We were like, all right, we, we see what's going on. We, we know how the media works. We know how they drive fear into people. They want everybody to be in fear constantly. You know, the media, the news outlets, doesn't matter which one you listen to, right or left, their whole job is to drive fear into anxiety into you so you depend on the government mm-hmm. to fix that. And it's, uh, I think um, you're starting to see more people wake up to that. Um, yeah, but same. at first it was like, dude, I wish people could see the truth of, you know, just how corrupt, uh, some of our government officials are and the media is, but you know, you, I think over the past couple of years, people have gone through enough to where people are starting to wake up. Yeah, well, I think formats like this podcast where people actually have the space to set to actually communicate, yeah, gives people a better opportunity <clears throat> to absorb information that they actually could process, opposed to sound bites and talking heads shoving things down your throat. Oh, that, for sure. So I mean, that's all I listen to now is podcasts, and that's where I get my information. And mm-hmm. you know, and I, I wouldn't say every person I listen to, I'm like, yep, that's that's the truth. But the formats are long enough to where you can critically think on your own be like, oh, yeah, like I either agree with that person or what he's saying, and you can look it up and be like, oh, that is true, Um, rather than, you, like you said, the five-minute bits of – and I'll tell you, like I went on Fox and when I was going through that stuff, and Fox was favorable to us. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when I would go on, it was like, hey, you have three minutes, and the questions that they ask are – driven to what they want right so what i tell people when they go do like little little hits if they are trying to you know get something out is like dude have something pre-planned and if they ask you a question that's driving in a different direction it's on you to drive that back to what your point and what you want to say and get it out because like a a quick debate yeah (laughs) super quick and it's sad that it's like that you know and it's sad that that's where people get most of their information um, that sort of drives the narrative, um, because it's driven in a certain direction, no matter what, no matter what side of the fence you lean on, um, they're pointing you in the direction they want you to go. Yeah. Yeah. It's scary. I mean, yeah. there's a lot, a lot to process out there. It yeah. takes like a, you know, you have to be quite intelligent and, and savvy to dissect everything being thrown at you because it's easy to get caught up in group think and go down a rabbit hole and feel like that's the only way yeah especially if you live in an echo chamber you know on social media where you follow the same like-minded people um and you're just getting inundated with Mm -hmm. uh, this is what's going on and look at this and look at that and you're like dude this none of this is it's like half truths you know so i think it takes people to critically think through problems and i think with a lot of people have lost the ability to do that because everything is sort of easy right in your face like here it is you don't need to think here's you know oh you want groceries we'll just live out to your doorstep you want a ride uber here you go you want this which is all great i mean but it, it's also made people lazy i think uh physically and intellectually well you told me you get up at 4 a.m and run 20 miles so right now i am <laughs> yeah that's uh <laughs> That's, you know, that's an, an event that I have coming up, and it's sort of my, my purpose right now. Awesome. Um, 
yeah, it's good. I, I like it. Um, and again, I'm detached, you know, I'm, mm-hmm. I, I switch between listening to music and not listening to music when I do it. Um, and I can tell you, I, from when I do the ones that I'm not listening to music, it's harder when I get started, but at the end of the run, I feel 10 times better than when I was listening to something because again, you're being inundated with whatever type of music you're listening to and it can sort of put you in a certain mood or make you feel a certain way um, where if you're just you and your thoughts, you can sort of work through all of your problems as you're running. Um, Do you run on a treadmill or at the beach or something? I run, uh, so on a path here on the 30A, uh, it's about a, I'd say a 26 mile path. Um, So, you know, go down there and it is, it's right along the beach. So it's beautiful. You know, I'm spoiled. So it's like every run I go on, it's like, this is awesome. Uh, I live in probably one of the best places in the country. And then every once in a while, I'll go back to the treadmill just to uh, save my knees. So, but running 20 miles on a treadmill is a, uh, it's a mental test for sure. (laughs) Oh man. I I have a friend from Australia, Clint Kimmins. He described, he does marathons or Ironmans and he describes it as a screwdriver just getting slowly turned into your brain and he goes through these stuff. So I know what you have coming up and it sounds absolutely savage. Yeah, it will be. I'm the good thing is I'm doing it with a bunch of buddies that I uh went to selection with, uh that are you know, they're all out, so we're all gonna be there doing it together and you know, it's just like anything else. Uh I think each one of us is probably gonna go through a weak point during that two hundred miles, but you'll have your buddies around you to sort of keep you going. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's really the, the way I think a lot of guys get through selection as well is like, Hey, he's still here. I'm staying, you know, no matter how much misery you're in at the time um, and vice versa. So I think that's going to help out a lot, uh, oh, yeah. but yeah, it will be a mental, a mental challenge. I think more than a physical. So you said it sounded like you um, back to the nine months you, you served. It sounded like you had a, uh, increase in your faith with the higher power and then did you lose faith completely with the government and the system that you chose like the majority of your life to protect uh i didn't i i wouldn't say i've lost complete faith in it um mm-hmm. i think i try to remain optimistic and that you know we just need to get the right people back back in office people who actually care about this country and uh, our values um but i did what it did, because I was always a man of faith, but I held my job, uh, which was being a SEAL, above my faith the whole time. Like, that's what drove me. I had that on a pedestal, you know, um, and that's what I I would do anything for it. Uh, but, yeah, that, that turn of events that happened sort of flip-flopped that, and I was like, like I said, my eyes were opened. Um, I was like, the things that really do matter in life were shown to me. Um, and so, yeah, from this, from that point on, I've, you know, I, I said to myself when I get out, when, and if I get out of this, like I am going to do nothing but try and spend time with my family, um, make the most out of, out of life, um, and not sell myself to something that, uh, is not, um, not real, uh, you know, so yeah, it's I've, I count it as a blessing for sure. Um, Love it, man. Yeah. So you got so you you have the bags. Um, oh yeah, products. Yeah, you have so many products now. I know, which is awesome. I mean, you brought in this apparel too now um, that you'll be launching soon, which yeah, I think is in sick. January, right around Shot Show, just wearables that you know part of our mission is to make you know empower humanity to disconnect. Mm-hmm. And if we can make that relatively effortless, so it's convenient, it's not cumbersome, and it's not inhibiting to your daily routine, whether you're, you know, doing a low vis operation or whether you're a normal person or traveling or whatever use case it is, because there's a lot. Um, just want to make it convenient, so yeah. you can take your tech and and mute it for the time and the place that you need it. No, it's awesome. Yeah, I mean this jacket you brought in mm-hmm. and the pants, matching I'd- pants. And what I really like about your guys' products is just how sleek the designs are, right? They're not, like, out there in your face. Like, mm-hmm. it's exactly yeah. what it's supposed to be. Thank you. Yeah, it's been part of the brand since the beginning is kind of have a 
mute branding small. We we care about ourselves, but we want to be cryptic enough so it's like you know no one's the wiser really yeah. on like what you're doing. Um, but yeah, the crossbody right here, the E3, we've launched a collection that's really slick, all recycled materials, and has dedicated Verde sleeves on the inside. Um, but yeah, what started off as a tiny sleeve is morphed into <laughs> wearables now, and a um, bunch of different backpacks. And we we make a ton of products in the U.S. now too, fully berry compliant, so U.S. materials, U.S. made. Nice. Yeah, which took a long time, and it's really expensive. Yeah. Um, different making products here. We make products in Vietnam as well. Um, but yeah, the special ops guys need our products, and there's that's what I was going to ask next. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I have some questions for you too and your perspective on like electronic warfare. But um, from what we're seeing is that sig signal management and being mindful of what you broadcast mm -hmm. or receive is is paramount. Oh, and for sure. As, as well as EMP associated with with that. So our products, you know, equip the warfighter with tools that, you know, at the end of the day, like don't get them killed. Yeah, and. It's, you know, the experience that I have with the electronic warfare, and I'll be the first to admit I, I'm not, I'm a door kicker, right? I am not, like, too involved in how all that stuff works, but I have had it affect us. Um, so, you know, my last deployment in Mosul, we were out, um, you know, pushing through Mosul, and the there was up journalists out there um, running all over the place, which I was like, insane i mean we, a lot of them got killed uh but what would happen is these journalists would be out there with their phones and snapping pictures and we would tell them like hey stop like don't but it's, it's only so much you can do and mm -hmm. what isis was doing so these journalists would snap a picture and then do like an, a quick article like about what was going on like well then real time yeah mm -hmm. isis would then geolocate that and be like okay they're right here and then they would track their signal and then the next thing you know we would look up we'd have drones overhead and then wow. orders start landing all around us and th i mean it would happen within a matter of 20 minutes so yeah i mean it is it's real and i think it's only been advanced from there so oh wow i mean that's a thanks for show, sharing that i mean that's that's what you, it's happening in ukraine and russia yeah like that's the, the the battlefield's really extended into your pockets. Yep. Like you were taking, you're taking it home with you too. Exactly. Which is pretty scary. Yeah. So, I mean, and those are, I think, I mean, and it's, it's pretty crazy from like the time, because I, you know, was part of the invasion in Iraq and then pretty much was all through the GWAT till the very end. Um, and that was my, my, my first appointment was to Missoula, Iraq. And then my last one was back there. Right. And just the advancement of not just like the weapon systems, the gear and all that, but also the technology. Well, the enemy is also adapting to everything that we do. And they always find a way to sort of combat all the advancements that we have. And they do it in a very simplistic way, but it, it's still capable and it's, they still have an ability to reach out and, and touch you if they want to. So, I mean, the ability to protect ourselves and to, to protect our signal and our stuff like that is, I think going to come in huge here in the near future, especially with what's going on right now. Oh uh, my God. It's a uh, alarming. Yeah. It's a, uh, I think we're in a pretty critical time. Uh, if you were to deploy tomorrow, what would you, would like signal management and, and devices be like in the top tier of um, oh it'd be the top five things I would I would be taking with me I mean I would definitely have Faraday bags every backpack I have would have the ability to block a signal I mean why take a chance yeah. at all um, especially if you're deploying into a known uh, combat zone or a place that uh, is not permissive so mm. yeah. yeah that I mean fires me up to have products that serve that use case because we put a lot of time and effort into trade shows and networking and you know, we've won some air force contracts as well so we're you know boots on the ground developing products and i'm a civilian but to serve the modern warfighter is is an honor oh well i appreciate it. i'm glad that you you are doing it um and we need a lot more 
smart minded, like minded guys like you out there doing the same um, with good morals and ethics along with that, you know, funnel a little bit more of that defense budget to small businesses so they could rapidly innovate and, well, and get things quicker. Yeah. Hopefully uh, we'll see a change in that next year. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> That's what I think we're all hoping and praying for. Yeah, um, sure are. But yeah, man, is uh, where, where can people find you at? Um, uh, SLNT.com mm-hmm. or on social. It's go SLNT at go. Okay. Yeah. But we pronounce it silent. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it morphed. I mean, we hit a little IP issue in Europe. So we kind of created SLNT, got the domain and it's actually allowed us to kind of pierce through all the BS out there and become a proper brand that cares about style and aesthetics and utility. And we have a lot of IP around what we do. So nice. um, it's been a fun, fun journey to watch it morph. And I appreciate you having our back. Um, and of course, support, man. Supporting what we're doing. The, the use cases are really serious. And they're also applicable to every walk of life. So, yeah. you know, people think they have nothing to hide or this doesn't affect me. But it actually does. And the one thing I'll say on that is, like, the erosion of our civil liberties can can be slowed down if individuals rise up and, and do something about it. Um, so I feel an obligation to lead with education and take silent to a place that is more than just physical products, but... Um, allows people to adopt a tool and, and a mind state that allows them to, you know, live a better life, excel. Yeah. No, I mean, I think the, yeah, you have a really awesome product here. And, I mean, not only do you have an awesome product, but the mission behind it, I think, is uh, definitely needed um, in this time and space for sure. And I hope that uh, – I hope to see more of this product being uh, worn by not just – uh, the military, but also everyday civilians, because uh, like you said, everybody needs to be protected. Um, you may not be a target until you are one. And that's, that was our, our statement when we were going through what we were going through, like, Hey, if this can happen to us, it can happen to you. Mm. Um, and I think more and more people are seeing that nowadays. And I think silent is definitely uh, one of those products that people need to get their hands on for sure. Awesome, man. Appreciate that. Yeah, man. Big time. Awesome, bud. Well, I, I appreciate you coming out, man. It was great talking to you. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll definitely stay in touch in the future here, and uh, hopefully do some more stuff together. Yeah, sounds good. All right, buddy. Thanks, man. Out.